Born on the slopes of Mount Kenya in Kirenyaga, Duncan Morioki still has the love for nature in his 40s. Of course, uh, growing up in the countryside was very different and that's what made me love nature because we were all, everything was nature, 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 green and all that. Walking to school, back and forth. And then I came to Lenana, you know, we were from very different backgrounds, you know, we had very well off kids. And that's what opened my goals and my horizon because I met kids who are from very, very well off families. And I said, you know, one day I want to catch up and be more than them. It was during his heydays at the university through rare circumstances that he found his dream to be a professional tour operator. But then when I was in the university, I used to sit in one of the lectures in a class that was facing Lillian Towers then, Nairobi Safari Club. And I would see some tour vehicles from a company that I then joined. And the whole operation used to look so, so aloof, so elitist. And I said, I want to work for those guys. And that's how I focused. And I then approached that company. I convinced them after university and I became a management trainee. He entered the tourism sector with a lot of jest, only to find out that the field was highly dominated by foreigners and it was meant for a select few. You know, there are some things that were done exclusively by certain people. The company was still a bit... Uh, Western oriented, so some of the good safaris used to be handled by, by foreign tour leaders. We can call them Zungus, they come all the way from London to lead a tour. Yes, and they're leading tours in Kenya, and I said, wait a minute, I want to see how much they know about lions than our people don't know. So I insisted on going for some of those tours with them, uh, so the foreign uh, tour leaders, or what we call them professional safari guides, and I went with them because I wanted to know what happens. That is why you see the industry was very much dominated by the Mzungus and the Mohindis, or the, the, the more privileged in the pre-independence days. The ones who had enjoyed the historical advantages, the ones who had the historical uh, advantages before independence, they had setups, they had land that they could use to mortgage, to buy vehicles. They are the ones who could be able to afford marketing trips because they had a solid foundation base from you know, their, their grandparents who are the settler. That's why you see the industry was mainly, even now it's still primarily um, um, uh, light-skinned um, controlled. He withstood great pressure to rise to position of heading the same company he trained with. For 24 years, he has seen tourism grow in leaps and bound. It was there, but it was there by default because we never really had a marketing strategy for Kenya. There was never Kenya tourism board then. We have never had a tourism policy until the one which has just been put in place just now. So tourism grew by default. Those who were hunters in 1977 found themselves without jobs when Kenyatta said no more hunting. So what could they do? With their shots and their big hats, had to go and uh, guiding people with cameras, shooting with cameras. So they became tour operators. There was more money to be made in shooting and killing animals. So they found the next best way to earn a living is to take people on safari. Humans have encroached on the wildlife habitation leading to human-wildlife conflict that is becoming a common phenomenon. The, the, the laws we have are so colonial and so un-African and so anti-native as we call them. The natives were never seen to be of value. That is why a life of a human being was peanut. And that is why you see people, that compensation law doesn't make you feel, people, make people feel they're compensated. I mean, look at them. It's, I mean, if you look at the, the, what you compare a human being, you know, the family can sell all those tasks and be better off. I'm sorry to say. So the compensation law have to take the human factor of the of the victim, eh? and that the the law cause that human uh, uh, human beings with a, who are resource that must be adequately compensated, including their property. Otherwise, you'll always have human wildlife conflict, and the human. Yeah, they are, they, the people will always look at the animals as an enemy. We need to stop looking at the animals as an enemy by making them feel that those animals are bringing value to them. Even as the country boasts of its richness in wildlife within the region, questions of embracing local tourism still remains a great challenge. Yeah, but which, which is what we have been made to believe because tourism has basically been seen as a Muzungu Muhindi affair. Yeah? <coughs> you don't touch this. It's like, but tourism is for all of us. We all benefit from tourism. Do we as Kenyans know what is there to see in Rwanda? Do we as Kenyans know what is there to see in Ethiopia? Secondly, do we have incentives to travel between the region? Do you know how much it is to fly from here 
to to like in Zanzibar. Yeah? The other day a friend of mine was looking at a flight from here to Eldoret. Do you know how much it is? That cost of here to Eldoret will take you from New York to Las Vegas. So what are we doing? We are obviously making it very difficult for ourselves to see the region. As tour business evolves, targets of meeting the growing demand by major players within the sector are now encouraging for conference tourism. Conference tourism, basically, there is a sector in tourism we call it MICE. Meetings, incentives, conferences and events. And that's what we have basically, you know, pushed all our effort to. It is business travel. As long as a country is stable and an economy is growing, there will always be business travel. People not going for leisure, but going to do work by meeting because they are meeting to have a seminar. That is a necessity travel. It is not leisure based. That is why it's very lucrative. You can see hotels coming up in Nairobi. They're not coming up because of the tourists. The tourists are there, but that is, that, they are, the hotels have more capacity than the tourist market. They are mainly targeting the business travel. Conference tourism is not only deemed to increase the number of tourists, but also open up channels for homestays, which are deemed more cozy and cheap than the traditional lodge and restaurant accommodation. There is more than just seeing the lion and the, the elephant in tourism. A lot of people are making money on homestays, a house like this, you know, with a few extra bedrooms. You realize that, hey, I can actually make some money by saying, come and stay with us. Experience African... Um, experience, uh, African uh, uh, touch. Mm -hmm. That is why, you know, in my, my experience, I am pushing and promoting homestays a lot. Anyone with homestays, I'm trying to say, bring your information together. Let's tell the world that Kenya has these homestays. Because everyone is trying to sell their own little homestay alone. So, so the economy actually will, other than just the traditional lions and elephants and all that, those homestays will also generate much more. And then it will also make sense because after, uh, the Kenyans will feel the benefit of tourism. The Ministry of Tourism is currently underway in identifying and registering homestay units. Young entrepreneurs are being encouraged to invest in the cottages that are fetching good returns. Absolutely. They, they are good returns. Why do you think people try to make it very secretive, very quiet? They are good returns. The community that has been involved in tourism don't make noise. They are very, very quiet because they are making money quietly. But Kenyans need to join in that. They, they deserve um, a share of the national cake. You know, the, the, the non-indigenous people have not put their foot in it because they thought they could not. Has this been, it, that is why it has been seen as a Muzungu Muhindi affair. We must change that perception. And the moment we change that perception, the politicians will support tourism because the voters are there. Because tourism has never been a voting issue. So when we have voters, uh, you know, locals and everyone now interested in tourism, the politicians also get interested. So it becomes a voting issue. Then the cabinet is able to make decisions that favor tourism because they don't always favor tourism because they don't even understand it. Last year, figures by the Kenya Tourism Board show that Kenya fetched 96 billion from tourism, falling short of 2 billion of its target. This is despite fears of dwindling bed capacities in the country. The government always goes to Mombasa for seminars. Even most companies, Mombasa, Mombasa, Mombasa cost. Many of them do not realize that even here in Masai Mara, you have similar facilities that you can actually hold a conference. Don't go to Mombasa every time. I know Mombasa people don't like this. But open up other areas that have facilities. Yeah, there are facilities out there for conferences. And then even if you want accommodation in Samburu, you know, you take them to the next adjacent hotel. However, the homestay drive targets to raise bed capacities from 40,000 to about 65,000 before the end of this year, as envisaged under the Vision 2030. Henry Miner, GBS.